Buenas tardes a todos. Hello, everyone. So this talk is actually in English, so I will be speaking in English, but uh, hablo perfectamente español. So si luego tienes preguntas y quieres preguntarme en español o en inglés, lo que tú quieres. So uh, welcome to Testing Web Applications with Playwright. So it's time to play your tests, right? But first of all, who here actually knows what Playwright is? Okay, not bad. I count six people, great. <laughs> oh, seven, because Natalie put her hand up. Okay, great. So who here is actually using Playwright in production of those six people? Let me see. Nobody? Nobody? Seriously? One person. Okay. So we have a, we have a lot of work to do. Okay, but that's fine. Um, for those of you that don't know what Playwright is, but you went to the Microsoft booth and picked up all the stickers because you thought they were cool, that is great. Well done and thank you. Now you're going to learn what Playwright is. So first of all, uh, a little bit about me. So if this works, dun 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 dun. There we go. If you turn it on, it works. So my name is Debbie O'Brien. Uh, I'm Irish, but I live in Mallorca. I've been in Mallorca for 22 years. That's why I speak Spanish. And I'm married there, so I'm like half Mallorquin now at this stage. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft. And basically, um, my main role is in the community division and advocating for Playwright, which is an open source tool for testing. So um, yeah, this, this is my Twitter handler. If you want to follow me, you're going to see me. Uh, that's Debs underscore Brian. And you're going to see loads of pictures of me running and cycling around Mallorca and, and doing lots of sport. I try to do three hours of sport a day um, because you shouldn't just be sitting on your computer all day. That is not how the world works. It's not how you get things done. So make sure you take time out of your day to have fun. It's really important. Still do your job, uh, still study, still do stuff, but have fun, whatever that is, sport, gardening, playing with the children, anything you want. And uh, yeah, so these are a couple of the programs that I am a part of. And um, I do a lot of work as well with the uh, with Google Women uh, Developer Technologies with like the award category, trying to get more women into tech. So I know I'm looking around here and I'm kind of saying, mm, where are all the women? So this is uh, something that I'm involved in. Uh, I see Natalia is there, so that's great. And we want to, and there's one over here, great. So you want to increase the diversity and trying to get more women in tech as well. Um, so if any of you are out there and want to be part of these programs, I especially want to help in the MVP program and get more uh, women MVPs in Spain. So if you're out there or if you're working with an amazing woman, send them my way, let them come and talk to me and I'll help them get into the program. Also, if you're a guy and you want to be part of those programs, also come and talk to me as well. So that's enough about me. Let's move on to what we're really here for. Testing. Okay. Now let me ask the one and only big question. Who here is testing all their applications? One person, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, you're, you're kind of all just saying, oh, he's testing, so I'm going to put my hand up. Is that what it is? Yeah, I see you. Okay. Um, who's testing sometimes? You know, every now and again. Okay. A little bit more of you. That's good. All right, now let's be honest. Who never writes any tests? Yeah, yes, they're all afraid to be honest, aren't you? Okay, great. So basically, um, we got a few problems. Why are we not testing all our applications? Anyone have the answer? Why are we not testing? Anyone, you can shout, I'll hear you. Boring. It's boring. <laughs> oh my God, I've never had that one before. I like that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to you later. Anyone else? Lack of time, yeah, that is a big problem. We want to do sport, so, you know, yeah, I get it. Anyone else? Yeah? By the time we finished, the project already uh, ended two months uh, before. Yeah, the program's already gone, you've, you've been paid, and it's all done, and then, you know, it's time to test, it's like, it's too late now. Okay, good, great answer. Anyone else? Yeah, pretty much basically what you said, but boring, I'm going to have to change my slides, damn. Uh, testing can be hard, right? Some people say it's harder to write the test than it is to write the actual code. Testing takes time to learn, especially if you're you know, new in development, you're junior developer, come on, or you're just joined in a company, or it's a new language. You've got to learn all this again. It's like, oh, this is too much time. Uh, it takes time to build you know, when you're running those tests, etc. And as you said, time is money, right? So you know, um, time is money, and we don't have the time or the money to spend on it. And culture, this is something um, someone told me last night where we were having beers. We do not have a very good testing culture. Like this guy over here said, we basically ship to production and then we think about the testing and it's too late. Well, what have we taught about the testing? 
first, earlier on, and started testing. And then you're like, test-driven development, that just doesn't work. I agree, it doesn't. So that's not what I'm going to teach you. I don't do that. Um, so now the question is, how can we get more developers to write tests? OK, tell me. What is the solution? What is the answer? What have you got for me? Stop stressing them out. Stop stressing them out. OK, we're going to stop stressing our developers. That's good. These are all very quiet. Make it easier. Who said that? Nice, I love it. Make it easier. OK, this is what we're basically going to do. If we can make tests easier, we're going to get more people to write tests. And that's what Playwright is trying to do. Or at least that's what Playwright is doing. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see. Basically, Playwright testing is reliable end-to-end -end testing for modern web apps. It runs on any browser. So you can run it on Chromium, on WebKit, on Firefox, doesn't matter if you're on a Windows machine, on a Mac, whatever you're on, it can run on all those browsers. Any platform, one API, full isolation, fast execution, and very powerful tooling. And I'm going to talk to you today about the powerful tooling. I'm going to show you how powerful Playwright is. My aim is then, at the end, I'm going to ask you all you know, to put your hand up if you're now going to go away and actually use Playwright or test it out. And you're all going to put your hands up, right? Good. Glad we got that one sorted. OK, so let me show you. Um, running the test, getting started. So everyone knows, right, getting started. We're going to create our new project. We're going to do .NET, new console, um, Playwright demo. We're going to CD into Playwright demo. And then we're going to do .NET, add the package, Microsoft Playwright. We're going to build it. And then we're going to basically just install the required browsers. OK, all good so far. After install, you're going to like, you know, you install NUnit on Microsoft um, Playwright NUnit. You create your test file, and then you run the test. And that's it. And that's where everyone gets lost, right? That's as far as everyone goes. We can install it, and then we like create that test. Maybe it might run one test, and then we go, oh, and then over here, it's boring, right? So this is what we're going to fix. This is what we're going to try and fix. I'm going to show you that testing is not boring. I'm going to make testing fun. Um, so. The way we can do that is by using powerful tooling. This is CodeGen. It's kind of like that robot you saw out there. Did you see that robot out there earlier? He was cool. Well, uh, CodeGen is pretty cool as well. CodeGen is going to generate tests by recording your actions. I like it. We all like to be actions, you know, and click and do stuff. We don't like to write tests, but we like to click. So I'm going to show you how CodeGen can help you write your tests, or just basically write your tests for you. So CodeGen, simple to actually just get running. Um, just run this command with CodeGen at the end. What that's going to do is basically open up these two windows, right? And one is my browser. OK, so that's my browser. And then over here is the test. That's where we're going to write our tests. OK, so that's basically uh, what we're going to do. And I'm going to live demo showing you how to write tests. I want you to kind of not worry about the actual code. I don't want you to think about the code. I want you to watch what I'm doing on this big screen here. And every now and again, just, just glance over and see how fast I am at writing code. OK, are you ready? So put your seatbelts on. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to test out the .NET podcast website. And over here, now I've written that code await page go to. OK, cool. And uh, this is a great uh, website here. It's got uh, a menu at the top. I'm going to just test the menu just to see you know, does that features go to the features section? Does the featured podcasts go to the featured podcast section? Does the available on go to the available on section? Look how fast I'm typing, isn't that good? And the powered by .NET, it goes to the powered by .NET and Azure section. And wow, I just wrote my tests. Thanks. You meant to clap. Oh my god, what an audience. <laughs> so, uh, Basically, I can stop the recording, right? I now have this test. And you're probably saying, yeah, but Debbie, you're a front-end developer, and I'm in a .NET conference. What are you doing to me? Right? So yeah, we can just go and change the language. Don't worry. And we can have our test. And now Debbie, the front-end developer, has just written .NET code. How cool is that? OK? Uh, you know if that's good. I don't, because I, I don't write .NET stuff. Um, but I've just written a .NET test. And I can now pass it to you, and you can put that into your application, and the test is done. So as a junior developer, as a front-end developer, as a back-end developer, anyone can come along and basically write the tests. And that's what I'm trying to show you here today. That's powerful tooling. OK, so yeah, I can copy that and put it in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, whatever you're using, and uh, test done. Go home and do my three hours of sport. Now you know how I can do three hours of sport a day. <laughs>
Okay, so let me show you some more. So as I just showed you, it's multiple languages, right? So you can uh, use Java, you can use JavaScript, you can use TypeScript, you can use Python, and you can use C Sharp. And you can use all of them, which means if you're uh, working in a company that, you know, an agency, for example, or any company that has a lot of uh, different languages that you're working with, you can all use the same tool. You can all use Playwright, and you can always all write it in the language that you prefer, that you are more comfortable in. And everyone's going to understand, because the same syntax, just a couple of little things change, and everyone's going to understand everything. And it also means you can have front-end developers testing Blazor applications, like I just showed you, and you can have .NET people testing Vue applications, right? Everything is possible. So it's kind of like really cool, the world we're living in. So let me show you some more. So again, we're going to do some more testing. I'm going to write another test, because you're probably like, that was too quick and I missed it. You know, maybe you were on Twitter and you just didn't see it. So if you didn't, watch again. So uh, I'm in you know, C Sharp this time. I'm going to record. So now this code, you're all going to understand more. And I'm going to test the search feature here. So I want to make sure the placeholder is there saying search here. So that's basically just written it there for me. And I'm typing in .maui, or just maui, and that's coming up. I found it. And you can see there's my code. Looks good, right? Await page locator, placeholder, search here, dot .click async. I've got a fill async of Maui and the press async of the enter. Test done. I'll go over and test some more. What else can I do on this page? What do I need to test? Um, again, I'm clicking around. This is what the user would do. The user's going to click, and they're going to find out more about this. And they're like, wow, this is a really cool podcast. I want to subscribe. I'm going to click the subscribe button. So now I'm subscribed, and you can see that checkbox is there. That's cool. So now I'm guessing that I should go to the subscriptions and see that there. And here we go. I've got my subscription. The text is there. And I know I'm going too fast for you. I'm sorry. I should, I should code slower. And uh, yeah, I've got my subscribe there. My text equals subscription. And I've got the text equals the .NET MAUI podcast. So bang, test is done. Stop the recording, copy it, put it into Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. And there's my test. Put it onto GitHub Actions. Sorted. Go home. Do more sport. Told you. OK. Um, so what else can we do? Let me have a look. I just write tests all day, basically. Um, so I'm going to show you something else about how you can also kind of find some errors as well. So again, we're going to go back to this website. And I'm basically, again, just you know the user coming along. And I want to go to the featured podcast. And this is actually true. I didn't you know, create this uh, specifically. I tested this. And these errors just came to me. Watch this, because it's actually quite funny. So uh, I'm going to test. There's a filter there. So I'm going to say, right, I'm going to filter for the Microsoft podcasts. And I come along here, and I've got, wow. I'm a front-end developer. I see these things. Maybe you don't see these things, but there's two images missing there. And I'm like, hmm, what happened? And as I open the image, it's still missing on this main page as well. And I can see it's got the alt tag there, um, the intro zone by Microsoft. It's a great alt tag, really, really nice but there's no image. So I've, all, I've just found a bug just by clicking around and writing that test. The website is already done. It's already built, but someone made a mistake. And I can inspect this in here, and I can try and, you know, doing my front end stuff, go in here and kind of figure out what is going wrong, what happened in this application, uh, what did the developer do wrong, and how can I help that developer find that problem and fix it. And basically, um, this is a very simple and Something that happens quite a lot where the image, the alt tag is the same as the image name. So someone is writing the alt tag, and the image name is coming in with spaces. And you can see it there, right? It's got spaces. It's got like you know, capital letters and stuff. And that's not how we should write image names. And also, we shouldn't have the alt tag the same as the image name. So now I can go back to the developer of this website, and I can say, right, I've just written your test. I'm now going to add an extra test, and I'm going to make sure the alt tag isn't the same as the source. So I'm going to actually write some real code. I'm not going to do that right now. But that's what I would do. So I'm going to make sure that that never happens. And you know, I looked at the other one that was working, and this one has. And you can see here, like, the alt tag is dot .future. Why would you have a dot in there? Right? Because that's, the screen reader is going to read out dot .future. It's like, why dot? What? And what exactly is, you know, OK, it's dot .future because the name of the podcast. But it's not really telling me anything. It could like say the dot net or the dot future uh, podcast logo or dot future logo or whatever, um, and that will give a better alt tag, right? So basically, this is what's happening. The alt tag is the same as the image name, and that's causing a problem, and we need to fix that and fix it for future. So this is great, kind of like you know improving my accessibility as well. So let me just talk to you a little bit about locators because we saw their page locator, and in case you didn't know what they are. 
Locators are a way to find elements on the page at any moment with built-in auto-awaiting and retryability. I like to think of it as those like pins on the Google Maps, like I'm dropping you here, this is where I want you to be, this is the locator. So uh, web-first assertions um, created with the page.locator, you've got a selector, you've got your options, and it's strict by default. That means that if you find more than one on the page, it's going to have a problem because it's going to say like, hey, what's going on here? And I'll show you how to fix that in a second. But yeah, await. So it must be awaited, and you've got expect page.locator, and then I'm using the header. So I'm, I'm guessing, in this case, my developer put a HTML semantic header in there, followed by the HTML uh, semantic navigation of, of nav. And I wanted to have the text async, and I've got an array here of features, featured podcasts available on, on powerby.net. I want to make sure that those four, so it's going to, you know, it requeries re those given selectors, and then it waits, it waits automatically for you until it has those four elements with those given texts. And I can just make sure that my menu has those. Um, there's lots of assertions. So we've got locators for absolutely everything. So you've got expect locator to be checked async. Uh, to be disabled, to be editable, to be empty, to be enabled, to be focused, to be hidden, to be visible, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's lots more. So that's you know, in the docs, and you can check that out. And then this is how you can kind of check your locators. So you can use um, CSS selectors. Anyone here a fan of CSS? Four people, five people. OK, I knew, I knew. I was coming to a .NET conference. I knew you all hate CSS. So yeah, you're, you're actually right in this circumstance um, that this is not the best practice, right? And sometimes when you use CodeGen, it might kind of give you a load of CSS classes because it finds that that's the best selector. And this is the time where the senior developer comes along and helps the junior developer and says, you know, let's not use this as a selector and select all those CSS because, you know, those front-end people like me, we're going to come along and change those, and then your tests are going to break, and you're all going to, all going to get very annoyed. So, um, but yes, you can basically select by any CSS, and uh, this is how we're selecting this here. But um, a better example of doing it is selecting things that are not going to often change, right? CSS changes a lot. Um, text doesn't and shouldn't change a lot. Like, this is the Hello World podcast, right? The text the name of this podcast is not going to change. So we can pretty much be guaranteed that that's going to stay there. So locators and has text, it's got case insensitive substring match and accepts both strings and regexes. So here we're saying, right, we're using one CSS selector here, I'm using dot card, but I could create an ID, a test ID, and use the ID. So that's also possible, right? That's just a choice of yours. Um, and I'm basically saying, right, they're not going to change dot card. I'm, I'm confident of that. And I want to see in that dot card, it has a text of hello world. And then I want to make sure that locator is a button. That is a clickable um, thing there, right, to subscribe. So I want it to be a button and not just something else. I'm, I'm actually explicitly saying you should be a button. You should be HTML uh, button. It's just shaped in a circle with a little tick. So and click async. Um, and again, this is another scenario where we have um, our podcast, we have our episodes. And I want to test that little clock there, right? So that clock over here is um, to basically listen to it later. So I want to make sure we can come along here and that the person can listen to that later, because if not, they're going to be very annoyed and they can't listen to that podcast later on. So I mentioned earlier that it's strict by default. So if I was to select this listen later icon, um, it's going to say, but there's three on the page. What do you want me to do here? I'm not really sure what you want me to do. Which one do you want me to click? So how can we fix that? So we can use locators plus has with our two dots there. And uh, we can say await page locator.row. Again, I have a CSS class at .row. I could put a, an ID in there if I wanted to. And I'm saying has, with our two little dots, page.locator of text equals Maui. So I'm looking for the locator inside the row where it has a text equals Maui. And what that's going to now give is this purple area. And you know, Playwright's going to say, right, now I'm just in this purple area. I'm not above. I'm not beyond. I'm only in here. I can only see what's in here. What do you want me to find in here? And then I'm saying, well, locator with an area label of listen later. And this is me writing the test. And I'm saying, you know, there's no text there, right? I'm imagining this is listen later. But there's no text there. And I'm actually going to make sure there's an area label. And funny thing is, if you go and view this, there's actually not an area label of listen later. So this is something that I was able to go back to the developers and say, hey, I really think you should put an area label on here because there's no text. And it's just like a clock. And, the screen reader is not going to know what to read out. It's just going to say, you know, button of, I don't know, don't know what you want to do here. So I could improve the website just by writing the test, which is kind of pretty cool. So yeah, 
It's going to check the area label of listen later, and it's going to click on that one. Uh, we click async, and bang, I've just tested that particular uh, listen later of the .NET Maui podcast. So, pretty cool. You can also test iframes. Um, basically, I didn't have, there was no iframes on that website, so I just threw a video of myself uh, just to show you that you can test iframes. And basically, with frame locators, it auto waits the iframes to appear, so you don't have to do anything, set timeouts or anything like that. And uh, you can see here, this is just a YouTube video, um, so it's not a great test, but you might have anything going on in there that you want to test that are in iframes. And you basically do um, var pause button equals page dot frame locator. Again, iframe, I've only got one iframe on the page, so it's going to find that one iframe. If you have two, then you have to put iframe first or put a, you know, find another way of spe uh, specifically selecting that iframe. And again, I'm using the locator. Um, YouTube does have area labels, so it's going to say area label pause or area label play. And then I'm going to await that pause button and click async. And then that's going to test that that button uh, actually works, right? YouTube are pretty good, so I'm pretty guaranteed that that's going to work. But you know, you might have other frames, iframes that you want to test. So that's kind of pretty cool. Okay, so let's get to running some tests because you know, running tests are more fun. So you can run all your tests together. You can run a set of tests. You can run a single test. You can run tests in parallel. And tests run super fast. And I'm telling you, it runs super fast. You're literally going to run the test. And it's just going to be like green in a second. And you're going to go, OK, what happened there? It's like, it's just too fast. It's too fast, too fast. So uh, to run your tests, uh, .NET test, for example, and um, it's going to run it in like a headless mode. So you're not going to see anything. It's just going to like in the CLI, tests are run, done, you can go home. Now, if you, run a, if you want to run it in headed mode, you can add this code, which basically says headless equals false. So once we've got headless equals false, then it's going to basically um, you know, open that up, and basically you're able to see it. Right? It's also really fast, though. So it just opens it and it goes, do, 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 and you're like, oh, done. And you went, OK, I, knew it, I know it does something, but it's like too fast. I can't figure out what happened. So uh, that's when you might want to run it in debug mode, because then you can really slow it down and really see what's going on and what you're actually testing. So again, this code. Um, to run .NET run in debug mode, set that debug. And what's that, what that's going to do, I'm going to show you here how I'm debugging this. Um, so basically, I've opened it up in, in debug mode, and I can step through each uh, part of the test. So I can see here, uh, I'm awaiting the page locator. And as I step through each one, I can see um, over here the little red dot that's being selected and what text is being selected as I'm kind of clicking through kind of seeing what's going on here. And um, what I've got is I've got, I've got a little error on the page. There's a bug there, and I'm going to try and fix it. So as I step through, I've got this listen together text, right? So text equals listen together. And I don't know, it's at the very top there, but I can't see any text of listen together. So I'm going to explore it a little bit. I'm going to put in just you know room code. And I can see it goes down to the room code there. OK. So I'll put listen together again. And I'm like, where is this listen together? Now, the text together is down there at the bottom. OK, settings down there at the bottom. That's found that. Um, but listen is kind of not, it's showing me the top, but I can't see a text called listen together. So that's kind of strange. And if I scroll down, it's telling me there's an error here, right? It's saying it's waiting for the selector of text equals listen together. The selector resolved to a hidden h1 tab index minus 1. Don't do tab index minus 1. Um, I can write even text equals hello and like, there's no hello there, right? Debbie doesn't, isn't there as well. So it can, it's clever enough to say, right, you don't exist. But listen together exists. So it's there, but it can't be clicked. Playwright cannot click on this listen together because it cannot see it on the page. The user cannot see it, so Playwright cannot see it either, right? It knows it's there, but it can't click on it. So again, we can use Explore to kind of just you know, click again on selectors and hover over, and you can see you know, what you could be selecting. Maybe you're just writing your tests or fixing uh, some things or just checking you know, what can be selected. So again, here, just kind of like hover around, click around, and have fun. We still have that problem of listening together. I'm going to show you later how I solved this problem, because it's kind of really, really cool, and how I went back to the developers and went, ha, 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 look what I found. Um, and it's really interesting, actually. It's going to come in the next video. 
So what we can do is trace files. We can record a trace for each test. So we've finished debugging, or maybe we didn't find that error. Maybe it got into production. It's up there. Now we've sent it all up, and we're like, we want to see a trace of what's happened. This is our kind of like last step, and this is my favorite step. So we have to set this up so we can set this with um, screenshots true, snapshots true, sources equals true. And you can see there, there's like a path over here. There's a path of trace.zip, right? That's where my trace uh, file is going to be. And once we do this, we're going to rerun our test again, right? Because now it's got this new configuration. It knows it wants to create a test. So then we can go to trace.playwright.dev. And what we can do is literally drag and drop and throw our trace file up there. Or we can select the file, whatever uh, you prefer. And as you can see, this is a progressive web app. This is not going up into the cloud. Nobody's stealing your code. Nobody's seeing your bugs. We can't see anything. It's literally on your local machine only, right? So it's just like running on your local machine. And let me show you what it does, because it's really cool. So once we drag and drop that trace file that we created, I'm going to throw it up there. And we now have this. And you're like, whoa, what is this? So this is your trace file. And as you can see, it's like kind of um, developer tools, right? At the very top, you've got that bar going across. And this is showing um, basically the state of your website as it loads on every single moment and how it's changing over time. Um, then you've got over on this side over here, you've got your actions. So each action as it goes through also shows the metadata. In the middle there, we can see our website. We can see the action, what we clicked. We can see before what it was doing and after what happened. And then we have our call. We can see like, you know, what's happened, uh, the call that we use page go to, the URL, wait until, uh, the response, the log. We can see the console, if we have any errors in the console uh, during that test. We can see the network, what network um, errors or network things are going on. And we can see the source file of the test. So this is really cool. I'm going to show you in action how it works. So now this is like, excuse this a little bit, because this is my front end part coming along here. And I'm using um, the front end to actually run the test, because I still don't know how to run .NET. You're going to have to teach me one day how to get my computer to run .NET. Um, so I actually run it in JavaScript. So you're not going to get this in, um, in .NET. You will get this if you're running just the Playwright test runner, um, which this is basically like a HTML report. So I'm running it from this, but you would basically have to drag and drop just how I showed you. So that's how you do it in .NET. Um, but I just wanted to show you this because I wanted to be able to show you graphically um, how it's testing in mobile Chrome, in mobile Safari, in Chromium, and WebKit. And what's really important is it's showing me two tests passed and two tests failed. And it's showing me that there's no flaky tests and no tests were skipped. And this is then, I'm, I'm going to show you now how I'm going to be able to debug and see what test uh, passed and failed. So let's take a look and see. Um, the first one we're going to test is the Chromium. And as you can see, this is the report that I got uh, from running it just with the Playwright test runner. And it just goes through each test one by one. And this is my trace file, right? So you would get that in the path that we set that you'd be able to drag and drop. So that's basically where we're getting this from. I'm just able to click it from here. So I open it up, and now I've got my website. And you can see, I'm going to scroll across there at the top. And it was loaded. Uh, the load state, the expect text, you know, what's going on. You can see each one of those. The locator has text subscriptions. Uh, that's what the website looks like at that point in time. When I click to listen later, this is what it looked like. So I can go through that whole bar and just run across and see. I can then go through each action step by step, walk through it. This is kind of fun. So I was like having fun doing this. You see boring lady over there. And uh, then I've got, you know, expect to have root. We got located at click text equals subscription. You can see I've got a blazer error here, right? So I'm like, I have no idea how to fix this. But I can go back to the developer and say, you've got an error going on here. And I can look in the uh, network, and I can see you know, what's going on here. There was uh, some you know, errors were aborted there. Uh, I can see um, the hello world image with the you know, uh, spaces in there. I can see the headers, um, response headers, response body as well that was returned. I've got full access to the network there. So again, I'm going to run through. I'm not going to worry about the Blazor error, because I don't know how to fix that one. I want to worry about the other errors. So I can see here, h1 has text equal subscriptions. OK, this is cool. Uh, my subscription is there. Um, my listen later is there. This is kind of cool. This is all you know, working. So before and after, there's not much change there, because I didn't do anything. So if I look at the next one, 
This is where it kind of changes. So before, listen later, and after, listen together. So the action that was clicked and the before and after state. And this all looks pretty good. So I'm going through this, I can see the source, and this is what's failing on mobile but working on desktop. So I can just kind of like getting a feel of understanding because I didn't build this code. I had never seen this code before until I actually wrote this talk. Um, I can see it's tested on the, on the Chromium engine. It's not mobile. Um, so this is great. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to find that test that is failing. So again, I wrote this test and I found this error and I need to fix it or tell the developer how to fix it. And it's basically saying, and we saw this before when we debugged, uh, the target closed, it's waiting for the selector of text equals listen together, and there's a hidden h1 tab index of minus one. So we know it's not there, but I want to try and find out why it's not there, or what's happening, and how I can fix it or suggest to the developer to fix it. So, okay, this is fine. I'm going to go down, and um, I can see the error when the error happened. And, and I, yeah, this is the error, and I'm going to see the trace file, and I'm going to open that trace file, and you can see now that this is the trace file of the mobile version, right? It's all done mobile. This is looking exactly how I want it to look. So I'm going to try and investigate what's going on. So I'm going to go down to where I was in the desktop from listen together. OK, so I went on the before, listen later, and after. Um, this is the listen together, right? And there's no text there. Now, we saw that. We know that's not there. So we're going to like say, OK, it timed out, right? Timed out. Uh, this is my, the action was interrupted, the text is listened together, strict is true, and the log there, and what's going on. And you can see here, in the desktop, it's working. I've got that text of listen together. That's a H1 heading. It is there on desktop. Why is it not there on mobile? This is the same website, right? It's not a mobile application. It's the same website in responsive mode. Why is that not there? Anyone know why it's not there? Anyone imagine why it's not there? No. Suspense. OK, I'm going to keep you in suspense. Keep it there. Keep it there. OK, so this is really important. What I showed you in the middle is a DOM snapshot. And that means it's not an image. It's a DOM snapshot. And you can interact with the DOM, inspect it, etc. This is where it makes it really fun. So I know I have this error. And now, basically, I'm going to try and inspect it. So I'm going to come along here. I'm going to say, right, I'm going to find out what is going on behind the scenes. So I can inspect that DOM snapshot, right? I'm still in that trace view. And I can click around. I can do my front end stuff and go to the DOM and try and find out what is going on. And as I click up here, and I kind of see, right, this is going up. This is not, no. I'm kind of not finding this. But oh, let's open this up. Let's have a look what's in here. Hmm. OK, I've got a title wrapper. Let's open this up. Oh, I've got a H1 class of title page. And I've got listen together. There's my text. Got my text. What's going on? Oh, look, the parent of title wrapper. Oh, let me zoom in. Let me show you this. This is the fun bit. Du -du 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 -du. There's my title. And what's happening? Display none. Lovely. So there's my text. Uncheck that display none. Uncheck that CSS. And now I've got my H1. So what happened here? Anyone ideas what happened? Why is it display none? Yeah, responsive, but basically it's not the fault of responsive. It's the developer decided to basically look at how it's split into two parts. And the developer along here went, oh, when I do flex, this is going to go, and the title is going to go at the bottom. And now how am I going to fix this? Display none. <laughs> right? Yeah, it fixes it. It looks nicer. But now we've got no H1, which means we've got no screen reader reading it out. It doesn't look right. My test is going to break. So my test has figured this out. And uh, I can go back to this developer and say, you know what, you can kind of do other things at Flex and change the order so that can go on top. Uh, I can help you fix this, but let's not do display none um, because you know users on mobile want to know that that's the listen together page and what's going on. So again, this is how you fix it, but you can like really interact with that DOM snapshot and actually just play around with it. And uh, it's it's you can click about it as I didn't click it there, but you could actually type in and click it as well and kind of you know really have fun in the DOM snapshots. So it's a really cool tool. So basically. Playwright testing comes with CodeGen, so you can auto-generate your tests. OK, writing this talk, I've never seen this application before. I was able to write those tests using CodeGen um, in a matter of seconds. And there wasn't editing done on that video. That was just as quick as it is. I can run the tests in debug mode, so I can step through it one by one, see what's going on at each stage, play around with the explore, copy that test then, put it into the uh, VS Code or Visual Studio. I've got locators. I've got uh, frame locators for iframes. 
and I can show those trace files and then really like go in and see what's going on and play around with the traces even more. Auto wait built in for all actions, so there's no need to set timeout calls. Tests run in parallel, so they're super fast, and you can run on multiple browsers and devices. You saw how I was able to do you know, the mobile and the desktop. And intercepting requests, so it follows all redirects, really important, it bypasses cores and it manages cookies for you. Yes, because we only like the cookies you eat, but those other cookies don't like them cookies. So yeah, Playwright does all that for you. So basically now, are you ready to Playwright? And this is where I ask the question, and I say, who here is gonna you know, go home, go back to work, and actually use Playwright? Yes, I am looking at you, those evil eyes, and I will find you later. I'm a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo, remember? <laughs> okay, excellent. So this is really, really cool. Uh, remember that Playwright is open source and free. So basically, uh, it's free to use, and it's open source. It's community driven, so if you do have any requests, anything that you see is missing, then open GitHub and create an issue, and the team will respond to it. Um, we're basically here, this is a community, and I want you all to be part of this community, so please also give feedback to anything that you, know, you see you want improving and you want more of. I started literally only six weeks ago, so I'm very new to Playwright, so if there's any mistakes in my code or anything, come and let me know, especially the .NET stuff. And the aim is to now create more material because we are very, very aware. Um, although Playwright has been around for about two years, uh, over two years now, um, and it's backed by Microsoft, so there's um, actually the team that created Playwright were the original puppeteer team. They've come along, so that's how Playwright has grown so much because they have all that knowledge and experience of puppeteer. And then they created Playwright basically on top of puppeteer. We were able to edit the code and you know, improve the code to do exactly what we wanted to do in Playwright. So Playwright is you know, free, open source, and we're gonna create a lot more content, a lot more videos, a lot more blog posts, a lot more tutorials, and anything you need, I'm the person to come and speak to. So come and find me and uh, ask any questions or anything that you want to know about Playwright. So uh, these are our links, the docs are there, the YouTube channel, the Twitter. Again, we'll create more videos very soon. Uh, the Playwright Slack, if you do have questions that are difficult questions, you know, technical questions, go to the Playwright Slack, the team hang out in there and they answer all those questions. As I said, it is community run. If you do have anything specifically you want to talk to me about, my email there is debbieobrien at microsoft.com or just send me a Twitter DM. You can go to my website, debbie.codes, uh, where they've got some blog posts as well on Playwright. And thank you very much. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask any question. I'm going to do a selfie because, like, you know, it's cool. You all put your hand up and go, yay! <laughs> okay, cool. So do you have any questions? Anyone? I can see you now that the lights are on. Yes, there's a question right there at the back. So a person with the microphone is going to run. Oh, lovely. Okay. Hello. Hello. This is one question in, in Spanish, please. Yes. Eh, llevo trabajando ya un tiempo con el framework, mm -hmm. en, en sistema de, de desarrollo, y me he encontrado un problema que no sé si me lo podrías eh, re resolver. Problems, play right slack. <laughs> <laughs> one question. <laughs> una pregunta. Eh, Playgray está concebido para validar la calidad del dato de un sistema, de una aplicación. Es decir, en base de datos tengo que pintar X elementos. Eh, ¿Cómo sé si tengo que pintar uno, dos, tres o cuatro? Es decir, cantidad del dato o, o, el, o la calidad del dato o el texto para poder va validarlo. Sí, básicamente, cuando hablamos del API, tú, tú a, a veces vas a tener que moquear algunas cosas, ¿no? Porque no sabes qué va a volver del API, ¿no? ¿Estás hablando yes. de esto? Sí, sí. Sí, so, también puedes, tienes que decir cuál es el momento de moquear o cuál es el dato que nunca, que nunca va a cambiar. Los podcasts van a cambiar porque los episodios van a cambiar. So, selectando este texto no es siempre el mejor idea porque el .NET Maui episodio de esto se va a cambiar, ¿vale? Entonces, ese es el momento que moquear y asegurar que tienes esto. También tienes que asegurar que hay a lo mejor mínimo de tres elementos. Se puedes contar los elementos, etc. Y luego hay testing del, del API que yo no he hecho mucho en esto, pero puedes mirar en la documentación o hablar conmigo luego y, y te enseño un poquito eso, pero es específico de testing de, de APIs. Sí, pero estaría más orientado a funcionalidad, por así decirlo, de página web, más que del dato, por así decirlo. Sí. Por ejemplo, en el negocio tengo una fórmula que calcula ciertos elementos con una, un cálculo y necesito saber que si pulso X botones, la fórmula me da el mismo resultado que hace en el código. 
Sí, no sé, de, de, de aquí mismo, sin, sin ver un poquito. Vale, um, vale. Pero mándame un mensaje y yo te mando a la persona correcta que pueda responder esto mejor. Sí, sí, me ha, me ha notado tu dirección. Perfecto. <risa> Gracias. Gracias. <risa> y el Slack. <risa> Uy, vamos. How do you approach logins with multi-factor authentication? Because in the examples we haven't seen you writing tests when you have no, to login. No, no hardcore stuff. I showed you all the easy stuff. So actually, I had this question last night while we we're having beers, which is very interesting, and I did not know the answer because someone said um, that they have problems testing logins. I'm like, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't tried it yet. Um, so I actually sent a message to, you know, the creator of Playwright and went, hey, what is the situation when it comes to testing um, logins? And he actually sent me a link with all the information of how you can test logins. And, and if you need that link, uh, send me a message and I will send you that link. Um, we need to document it better in our docs. I'm aware of that. We're missing uh, things of making it easier in the documentation to find things. Um, but yes, that works. There is a way and I will send you the link if you ping me on Twitter or on, my, on email, and that's how you, I, have, I haven't done it, so I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but follow that post that tells you how to do it step by step, and it should work. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, you've got five seconds to put your hand up. I'm walking off the stage. One. <laughs> okay, I think you pretty much have got it. But like I said, I don't have all the answers, not yet, because I only just started literally six weeks ago. Um, but seriously, check out, I know people hate, you know, que asking questions in Slack and stuff, but the developers of Playwright hang out in there. They know more than me. I'm just a developer advocate. They're the ones that are writing the code. They're the ones that can help you. But at all times, if you want to come to me, especially if you want to ask the question in Spanish, come and ask it to me and I will you know, filter that through to the right person and I will filter the answer back to you. So at all times, uh, feel free to just reach out. My DMs are always open. Um, y siempre puedes preguntarme cualquier cosa en cualquier momento. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.